we are uh, good morning everyone um, thank you for your attendance um, thank you to the representatives here present and the representatives of the state of the United States of America um, this is our number 35th hearing of the 169th period of sessions and it's our second hearing in this room this morning it is um, for the identification of the remains of migrants who had disappeared along the United States borders. Um, the, the hearing was requested by a large number of civil society organizations and groups. And it is the objective of this hearing is to discuss obstacles faced by family members who seek to identify and recover the remains of missing migrants found in Texas by the US authorities. S um, civil society will have 15 minutes for your initial submission, and the representatives of the United States likewise will have 15 minutes. And then we shall intervene as each person decides, and whatever minute we have left will be afforded and shared between you to make your closing um, addresses. Um, with that, without any further waste of time, I invite you to commence. Good morning, commissioners and representatives of the US government. My name is Mercedes Doretti. I'm the director of the North and Central America activities for the Argentine Forensic Anthropology Team. And I'm here today as a representative of the Forensic Border Coalition, comprised of forensic scientists, scholars, and human rights organizations working to address the challenges to identify the remains of missing migrants found on the US-Mexico border and return them to their families. Over the past decade, members of this coalition have been able to collect an exceptional amount of forensic information on missing migrants from Mexico and Central America that currently includes more than 4,000 genetic samples from their relatives corresponding to 1,500 cases, most of which likely went missing along the U.S. southern border. This genetic information, if compared against genetic information from unidentified remains found in U.S. soil, would most certainly produce a very large number of identifications that would end years of searching, uncertainty, and excruciating pain for hundreds of families living in Mexico, Central America, and in the US. We're here today because after six years of participating in meetings with US officials to find ways to conduct this genetic comparison, the exchange has not taken place, and we have not found cooperation from US officials to do it. Our samples have been used in isolated cases by US officials, but what we're asking is a much more efficient way of conducting this comparison, which is a large-scale DNA comparison between all available genetic profiles previously mentioned and the creation of an ongoing mechanism for future additional samples. The samples of families of missing migrants have been collected through governmental and civil society agreements established as data banks on missing migrants in Mexico, Central America, and in the U.S., some of these mechanisms have been recommended as good practices by this commission. All necessary legal paperwork, including chain of custody and donor's consent form, have been fulfilled when taking these samples. They have been processed at an accredited private US-based DNA laboratory, one of the best in the world, that is frequently used by the US federal government and other US states. The US has the technical capacity and resources to conduct this large-scale genetic comparison. If this takes place, it could not only serve families of missing migrants, but also set an outstanding example of international forensic cooperation that can be a model for other migrant corridors around the world. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Kate Spradley. I'm a professor of anthropology at Texas State University and a member of the Forensic Border Coalition. Within the United States, the majority of migrant deaths occur in Texas in poor counties that have no medical examiner or pathologist. These counties are not equipped to deal with this crisis and often send remains to a funeral home. If not immediately identifiable, funeral homes will bury remains in local cemeteries without state-mandated DNA sampling. As a forensic anthropologist within a university setting, my student staff and I perform volunteer exhumations and work towards identification. 
By state law, I am required to submit a DNA sample to a state laboratory for profiling and upload to the National DNA Index System, ENDIS. ENDIS is a DNA database with proprietary software that allows federal, state, and local laboratories to electronically exchange and compare DNA data. Out of 188 DNA submissions to ENDIS, we received 14 genetic associations. Due to federal restrictions, ENDIS lacks needed family DNA samples from Mexico and Central America. Therefore, we collaborate with NGOs. Through working with the Argentine team on a case-by-case -case basis through their family DNA samples, we have facilitated 14 additional genetic associations. Although the federal government has invested in a mechanism that uses modern technology to effectively compare DNA between the missing and unidentified, due to lack of appropriate DNA samples, we're forced to work outside the system on a case-by-case -case basis, which is antiquated, labor-intensive, expensive, and inefficient. Through NGO collaboration, we have established proof of concept that large-scale DNA comparisons could result in hundreds, if not thousands, of identifications for missing migrants. We are currently experiencing a global migrant crisis. Family DNA from Mexico and Central America exist in a U.S. lab that frequently contracts with the U.S. government. And the U.S. government has a federal database with DNA from unidentified human <coughs> remains. If the U.S. can't find a way to compare these DNA data, there's no hope for the rest of the world. Uh, my name is Bruce Anderson. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, for the last 19 years, I've been a forensic anthropologist in southern Arizona. Five years prior to that, I was a forensic anthropologist for a U.S. Department of Defense. I'd like to make seven points, if I could. <clears throat> In my 25 years working for the American government in medical legal death investigation, it has allowed me to make two observations. Government agencies cannot do it all, and the government is tasked with addressing the questions that serve the government's needs and not necessarily the family's needs. Thus, NGOs are needed. Point, point two, neither the federal government, Silhai, that was the laboratory in Hawaii that I work with, or AFDIL, that's the current DOD DNA uh, 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 lab, relied on law enforcement agencies to collect family reference samples. In fact, AFDIL used to mail kits to families, and then they would trust those families to fill out the forms and su supply the saliva and send them back. For our office, the Pima County Office of the Medical Examiner in Tucson, uh, we've identified about 364 of the 2,000 uh, known migrants through DNA. Only 47 of those were made through CODIS, and that's with Cal DOJ, uh, uh, University of North Texas, and Arizona DPS uploading uh, the profiles into CODIS. Most of our DNA IDs, 89% uh, are made at Bodhi Technology, a private lab, and we were able to make IDs there because people like Mercedes with, a, with a, uh, the Argentine team and Robin with Colibri and the uh, Mexican consulate uh, sends their family reference samples there. Number three, the local model utilized by us in Tucson has worked with using both governmental and non-governmental uh, 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 partners. A regional version of this would be very beneficial. Number four, we have partnered, the PCOME has partnered with Bodhi Cellmark to profile over 1,000 DNA profiles of unidentified border crossers. Because the Argentines and the uh, Calibri Center send their family reference samples there, we get identifications on a monthly basis. Number five, some families, some foreign national families do not trust the government, theirs or ours. Therefore, NGOs like Calibri and the Argentine Forensic Anthropology team serve a, serve a very important function. The last point I'll make, we currently are using the University of North Texas to go uh, uh, to review 200 cases that Bodhi did back in 2006, 2007 that were never CODIS eligible. We already have full profiles on these 200 people, all thought to be migrants but we've partnered with UNT to reanalyze the samples that remain for the express purpose of getting those into CODIS. Thank you.
Me llamo Jesús Reyes Leal y mi esposo Justo Mejía. Venimos de Honduras, de Morazán, departamento de Lloro. Venimos a pedirles ayuda porque tenemos a nuestra hija desaparecida en Fanfurria, Texas. Ella venía acá a este lugar a buscar un futuro mejor para su familia, para sus padres, pero alguien arrancó ese futuro de su vida y ella no pudo llegar acá. Pero nosotros, los padres con grandes esfuerzos, hemos podido llegar a este lugar para pedirles ayuda a ustedes. No vengo a pedir ayuda solo por mi hija, vengo a pedir ayuda por muchos desaparecidos que hay, no solo por mi país, sino por muchos países que tienen personas desaparecidas. Yo les pido a ustedes, ustedes pueden ayudarlos, yo sé que ustedes pueden, porque ustedes tienen la facultad, ustedes tienen el poder. Necesitamos que nos ayude, que el ADN que nos sacaron en Honduras en el banco de Forense, pueda ser este, aquí, ¿verdad?, con los restos que están aquí en los Estados Unidos para saber si nuestros familiares se encuentran ahí o están vivos. Yo quiero decirles, este pedacito de carne es pedacito de mi corazón. Tanto sufrimiento que hemos pasado es la única hija y ella se lo desapareció porque ella quería ayudarlos a nosotros, pero no pudo. Ahora le pido a ustedes que los ayuden a encontrar. Todas las madres sufren. Quizás hay unas que no han pasado por este momento, como nosotros estamos pasando. Un dolor día y noche desesperante saber qué pasó, qué estará pasando con ella. Pero yo sé que ustedes pueden ayudarlos. Ustedes los pueden ayudar. Porque en sus manos está el poder. Gracias. Sorry. Is there a technician that I can help with the video? de nombre Ana ah. Concepción Ortiz de Paulino sin pensar de que ella iba a ser una de las víctimas fatales del desierto desde ese momento en el 2006 yo ponía la demanda en Cancillería para que pudiera ser encontrada o localizada ella estaba en el condado de Weddon, Houston, Texas en una morgue que contenía 500 esqueletos humanos y Cancillería me daba este, tres meses para la repatriación. Pasaron esos tres meses, llegaron seis meses, incluso hasta el año, año y medio, y nunca se llegaba a la repatriación. Tuvimos que soportar 11 años, 8 meses para lograr este, que fuera identificada y la repatriación. Buenos días. Buenos días, señores comisionados. Señores uh, del Estado, mi nombre es Irma Carrillo Nevares, soy originaria de México. Eh, estoy aquí en este día para hablar de la pérdida de mis hijos, perdidos hijos, hace casi 20 años. Uh, tienen por nombre Yadira y Julio Galvez Carrillo, de de 27 y 24 años de edad. He hecho todo lo posible por encontrarlos, agoté todos los medios hasta que solo me quedó esperar, esperar este, un momento como este de tener personas de la importancia que tienen ustedes uh, dentro de, de, de los derechos humanos y de la representación del gobierno. Yo Vengo a pedir aquí este día que ya he esperado mucho, que cada minuto, cada hora que ustedes tomen en, en, en hacer una decisión que pueda cambiar nuestro sufrimiento, eso está restando mi vida. Tengo muchas enfermedades crónicas a raíz de la pérdida de mis hijos y yo vengo este día a pedir eh, ese apoyo de parte de ustedes para que 
Yo ya di mi ADN para que se haga la comparación y si mis hijos están ahí, me sean entregados. No espero ninguna respuesta en concreto, solamente quiero saber lo que pasó con ellos. Tengo a mi nieto también, César Galvez. Eh, yo lo que más deseo es contestar a la pregunta que siempre me decía, mamá, ¿dónde está mi mamá? Dime, ¿sabes si no me dices? Entonces, eh, en este momento uh, yo quiero pedir... Y quiero mostrar, sé que no puedo mostrar con palabras mi dolor porque es muy grande, pero quiero enseñarles mi corazón. Este es mi corazón, que está sangrando desde hace casi 20 años y estoy muriendo lentamente en una agonía. Pido por favor que sientan en su corazón como padres, madres y abuelos, porque yo soy madre, soy abuela y soy bisabuela, tengo un, una bisnieta, pido por favor que por todas esas madres que hay en el mundo y padres, hay un corazón como este. De ta, detrás de cada cadáver que se encuentra, de cada, de cada caso desaparecido, hay un corazón sangrando. Thank you so much. Remember my heart. Thank you for listening to me. My name is Roxanne Althos. I'm a clinical professor at UC Berkeley's law school. By failing to conduct a large-scale comparison, honorable commissioners, the United States is allowing bureaucratic impediments get in the way of human rights. The US's current system jeopardizes the right to life, personal integrity, and access to justice, among other rights, protected by the American Declaration. The United States must bring its current system in line with international standards and best practices. To meet its international obligations and comply with domestic law, the United States must investigate suspicious deaths with the aim of identifying the victim and cause of death, regardless of whether the state, regardless of whether state actors are responsible for the death. The Inter-American Commission has recognized the importance role and at times necessary role forensic techniques, specifically DNA analysis, has in the identification of the remains of the missing. To meet international standards, the United States should collect information from families of missing migrants for the sole humanitarian purpose of clarifying the fate of their missing relatives. According to best practice, practices, there should be a firewall between law enforcement, data collection, and data collected for identification. To meet its international obligations, the United States has a duty to provide information about the fate of victims to address the profound suffering experienced by family members. The suffering is, just, is not only unnecessary, it may constitute ill treatment and torture according to this body's case law. To meet international standards, the United States should return the body of bodies of missing migrants, their remains, to their loved ones for burial according to their traditions. The Inter-American Court has described the repatriation of the remains as an act of justice. There is no legal or technical reason that justifies the United States' refusal to conduct a large-scale comparison. A large-scale comparison should happen as quickly as possible. We also request that the Inter-American Commission uses its good offices to convene the parties to discuss the implement implementation of a solution. The Inter-American Commission has already helped the Forensic Commission to identify the victims of massacres in Mexico. Perhaps most importantly, the involvement of the Inter-American Commission will help ensure that the parties find a solution that meets international standards and best practices. There are many problems in this world that seem impossible to solve. This one has a solution. We hope today's hearing will mark a turning point and the start of meaningful cooperation between the forensic scientists sitting here, the families they work with, and the U.S. federal government. Thank you. Um, I now invite the representatives of the United States to make their intervention, and I mention the fact that you have one extra minute. Um, since the representatives used an extra minute. Fair play. We believe strongly in that. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. And first, we would like to start with our heartfelt condolences to all the family members that are here. Um, our, our 
heart and, and our sincere apologies. Distinguished Commissioners, Secretary General, colleagues, and friends at the other table, my name is Carlos Trujillo, and I'm the U.S. Ambassador to the Organization of American States. It's an honor to appear before you today and reiterate our support for the important work of the Commission across the hemisphere. We're pleased to be here today and welcome our distinguished colleagues who have traveled to Boulder to attend this hearing. Mr. Tony Miranda is Assistant Chief assigned to the U.S. Border Foreign Operations. He manages the Central American Desk and the Missing Migrant Person Persons Program, a U.S. Border Patrol National Program that operates in Tucson, Arizona, mm -hmm. and Seoul, Texas. Ms. Paula Wolf is the unit's Chief of Forensic Science Law Unit in the Office of the General Counsel of the Federal Bureau of Investigations. Mr. Randa and Ms. Wolf, we thank you for your attendance, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. My name is Paula Wolf, and as the ambassador said, I am the attorney representing the FBI in this matter. I'm also the attorney who is uh, assigned to and associated for issues relating to CODIS and the national district or the national, um, the ENDIS portion of that. And I want to say, first of all, before I start my prepared speech, that um, both as a mother and as a representative of the FBI, I cannot agree with you more. I don't think that we have any disagreement regarding the what must be done. The only issues are working through the how it is to be accomplished. And for that, um, I, I am very grateful that you have all gathered for this to make us aware of things. I am going to be reading a prepared statement that lists the qualifications, which I'm sure you all know by heart, as to what are the requirements for CODIS. I'm also going to say that especially because we are here in this law school, and as a representative of the legal community of the United States, we have laws which we must abide with. And if those laws don't satisfy our needs, if those laws don't accomplish the things that we need to do, then we must work together to change those laws. So please bear with me while I read my, my prepared statement. And it is, as the ambassador said, quite an honor to be here with you and a privilege to hear your stories and to help you, to help us work together to find a solution mm -hmm. to this extremely devastating problem. So the Combined DNA Index System, or CODIS, is a national storage medium for DNA records input by criminal justice agencies. These records can be searched in order to identify DNA associations with a DNA record obtained during the law enforcement investigation of a crime or the law enforcement investigation of a missing person. The design and legal rules governing the operation of CODIS reflect the system's function as a tool for law enforcement identification and do not allow samples or profiles within the scope of the system currently to be used in an unauthorized manner or for an unauthorized purpose. The DNA Identification Act of 1994, also referred to as the Federal DNA Act, authorized the establishment of the National District Index System, or ENDIS, and specifies requirements for participating in, lab for participating in laboratories relating to quality assurance and privacy. Additionally, the federal law defines the types of samples that are eligible for entry into the national database, including missing persons, unidentified human remains, and relatives of missing persons. And this is the national level of the CODIS system, which contains DNA profiles from participating federal, state, and local accredited crime labs. Using the national level of CODIS, the National Missing Persons DNA Database assists with the identification of missing and identified individuals. The Federal DNA Act requirements for the collection of family reference samples must be met in order for the DNA profiles to be eligible for entry and comparison in ENDIS. Pursuant to the Federal DNA Act, which is codified at 34 U.S.C. 1259-2, parens A, parens 4, only DNA samples collected voluntarily from relatives of missing persons are eligible for entry and searching in ENDIS. Therefore, relatives of a missing person must be willing to provide a DNA sample, to sign a consent form in the presence of an entrusted law enforcement entity, to establish law enforcement involvement in the investigation of the missing person. That is a condition precedent. The purpose of the consent form is to document that the DNA sample was voluntarily contributed 
and provides permission for the inclusion in CODIS maintained by the FBI in the United States for the sole purpose of identifying the remains of a missing person. It also indicates where, by whom, and how the family ref reference sample was collected. Additional information related to missing persons, such as names, dates of birth, are collected to, on the form to assist in resolving possible associations between relatives and unidentified persons. Pursuant to the access and disclosure provisions of the Federal DNA Act, the DNA information contributed by a relative or a missing person will be released only to criminal justice agencies for identification purposes and for comparison to DNA profiles related to the disappearance of individuals indexed in the CODIS missing persons database. The DNA profiles obtained from a family reference sample are only compared to the DNA profiles from unidentified persons within that database, within the CODIS database. Foreign nationals can be added to, the, the, uh, to ENDIS for the purpose of assisting in the, identif the identification of a missing family member. The Federal DNA Act does not limit the entry of a voluntarily provide family reference sample based on the domicile of the donor, no matter where they are located. However, any voluntarily provided DNA sample must be collected in the presence of law enforcement and include the appropriate consent form and information documentation in accordance with the statute. Access to CODIS, to CODIS delineated by the Federal DNA Act is limited to federal, state, and, and local D, um, criminal justice agencies. Accordingly, private labs do not have access to, to ENDIS for DNA profile entry and for comparison. And sir, in relation to your prior statement, that would be the Bodie Laboratory in, in Virginia. To be eligible for entry into CODIS, private laboratories must work in partnership with ENDIS and participating laboratories to ensure that specific requirements are met for the outsourcing of casework samples as described in Standard 17 of the Quality Assurance Standards for Forensic DNA Testing and DNA Databasing Laboratories. The FBI supports the inclusion of DNA profiles obtained from samples voluntarily contributed by relatives of missing persons, including missing migrants, which meet the Federal DNA Act requirements. The legal requirements apply to all samples equally. The FBI maintains a, maintains a publicly accessible website explaining <coughs> CODIS and the federal laws that govern its use. Additionally, the FBI actively participates in working groups and workshops regarding the identification of missing migrants to advise stakeholders on those requirements. For example, the FBI participation at a working group governed by the National Institute of Justice in 2016 included a discussion regarding the need for proper consent and information documentation from relatives of missing migrants. This exchange of information resulted in an effort by stakeholders to develop consent language that would meet the legislative requirements of CODIS. The FBI has also been pursuing ways of additional ways within the confines of the DNA Act to further assist in efforts to identify missing migrants. The FBI appreciates the opportunity to share information at this hearing about CODIS and its willingness to assist in the identification of remains of missing migrants recovered within the United States. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for having me here. Can, can you hear? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry. Um, as the ambassador uh, said, my name is Tony Miranda. I'm an assistant chief with the U.S. Border Patrol. I'm out of Washington, D.C. Currently, I'm overseeing the Missing Migrant Program. Um, I have a, a couple of, of points that I'd like to talk about in describing what the Missing Migrant Program is. But before I get started, I'd like to give you my sincerest condolences to the families, uh, to all the families that are here. Um, and I, and I want everyone to know that the Border Patrol does care. We are here to, to help, and as my colleague said, something does need to be done. And my, my presence here, my support from my agency, shows the, the willingness that the Border Patrol has behind this program or behind at least some type of program to be able to help the, the problem that we're currently seeing. Um, so, if you will, I have a, a couple of points that I'd like to, to read out. So, the, the history behind the Missing Migrant Program, as part of CVP, which is Customs and Border Protection, um, their attention to the humanitarian needs, the Missing Migrant Program was established by the U.S. Border Patrol in June of 2015. 
the Missing Migrant Program, the pilot program was initiated in the Tucson area, area of operation and subsequently rolled out into South Texas in June of 2016. The MMP, and I'll, I'll refer to it as the MMP, a lot of people know it as such, Missing Migrant Program, sorry. The MMP was designed to enhance relationships with foreign consulates and non-governmental organizations by providing a centralized line of communication via phone, electronic channels, and in person to assist with missing migrant reports. The MMP addresses the humanitarian concerns of families of missing migrants who are, who are presumed to be in distress or have perished while crossing illegally into the United States. During the pilot phase of the MMP, the Mexican consulates were instrumental in establishing best practices, reporting, and mechanisms throughout their 24-7 national call center, known as CIAM, which is the Center for Information and Assistance to Mexicans, which is now an internationally recognized hub for initializing missing migrant reports. Uh, some of the points that, and responsibilities that we currently have the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, U.S. Border Patrol Agency responds to reports of all missing migrants along the southwest border. The Border Patrol utilizes resources from the Border Patrol Search Trauma and Rescue Team known as BORSTAR, Border Patrol sector and station assets, as well as support from other federal, state, local, and tribal entities to assist in locating missing migrants. In order to aid in the search for missing migrants, the Border Patrol relies on reports from 911 calls to 911 dispatch centers, direct cell phones, communication, witness reports, and other third-party <coughs> reports that provide information on the location of migrants in distress or the, the location of, of remains. Upon discovery of the remains of an individual, the United States Border Patrol notifies the state or local authorities with investigative jurisdiction, as well as local county medical examiners. Agents from the USBP Missing Migrant Program assist medical examiners in the process of identification through fingerprints, macrophotography, and by leveraging information provided by family members, witnesses, or evidence collected from the scene. Uh, currently, USBP does not collect or analyze DNA samples themselves. All we do is we assist the, the local medical examiners or local county agencies in that, that collection process, which may include uh, relationships or liaisons with foreign consulates. Some of our current status, well, I'm, I'm sorry, some of the, the points on our current status, there are currently three full-time MMP teams, which include the Rio Grande Valley RGV, the Laredo sector, and Tucson sector. During the last quarter of the FY17, the MMP was approved as a national program and to be gradually implemented throughout all sectors on the southwest border. Currently, I'm overseeing the program and I'm in the midst of establishing a centralized database as well as a national policy that will be known across the southwest border. So this means to, for the Border Patrol, what this means is that we'll be operating with the same procedures and the same reporting mechanisms across the board. The MMP serves as a local point of integration for third party reports, family witnesses, foreign consulates, and missing migrants and unidentified decedents. The MMP assists county medical examiners, forensic pathologists, and foreign consulates in the identification process of deceased migrants encountered within their respective sectors. There are nine sectors currently, and I'm, I'm working on, as I said, a centralized SOP, so all nine sectors are working off of the same processes. Thank you for having me this morning. Yes. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I now. Um, you said you. I now um, invite um, my sister commissioner Flavia to intervene. Antonia, Antonia. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Um, quiero eh, empezar hablando en español. Um, quiero hablarle a los, a los padres de, de, los, 
de los chicos y chicas, ¿cierto? Que aquí vemos a los padres, a los hermanos, las señoras, no sé, a todos los familiares que están acá. Eh, es muy impresionante escuchar su testimonio, señora, y el suyo también. Y ver las fotos de, de las personas que están acá, que por lo que veo en las fotos, además, gente joven, que efectivamente venía buscando, ¿cierto?, un futuro para ellos y su familia. Y primero quiero simplemente... Eh, transmitirles mi, mi pena <risa> eh, y mi solidaridad y, y también el compromiso de lo que nosotros podamos como comisión hacer, eh, cuenten con ello, y, pero sobre todo nuestro acompañamiento y solidaridad y también acompañarlos en el, en el dolor. Eh, I also want to thank the representatives of the state and Sometimes in situations like these, we have states that don't emphasize with the pain of the people from civil society. So really, I want to mm -hmm. thank you. It's very important, and it's not usual. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to say that. Okay. And very meaningful. Um, I, I'm going to speak in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Yo quisiera hacer algunas preguntas a sobre todo al Estado. Eh, hay muchas preguntas que tengo, pero es, yo creo que mis colegas también tienen varias, pero de la información que nosotros hemos escuchado hoy y también hemos eh, recibido desde la Comisión, eh, entendemos que hay muchas autoridades locales de Texas que han cremado los cuerpos o los han eh, puesto en public ¿Cómo se dice? En, en fosas comunes públicas o los han llevado a la morgue sin identificar a aquellos cuerpos. Es decir, se deshacen de los restos sin la debida identificación previa. Esa es alguna información que hemos recibido. Como también hemos recibido eh, la falta de las autoridades locales a veces de voluntad de investigar y cuando llegan ciertos restos de poder investigar si el origen y también investigar que las responsabilidades. Yo quisiera saber si eh, han habido repercusiones e investigaciones para que a, aquellas agentes del Estado que tienen responsabilidad en las faltas de investigación sean responsables. No sé, no, 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 no me pareció no haber escuchado, pero quiero ver si hay investigaciones en el Estado para determinar responsabilidades de los agentes estatales que no han cumplido con su deber público de investigar. En, en, en estas materias y la investigación va desde identificar ciertos ciertos restos hasta iniciar investigaciones eh, legales eh, y, y en ese sentido también quiero recordarle al Estado eh, la responsabilidad del Estado en situaciones como esta no solo investigar y sancionar a los responsables pero, pero también reparar a las víctimas y quisiera saber si hay iniciativas en ese sentido también no sé si hay, hay ayuda a los familiares para poder eh, buscar la verdad de qué pasó con sus seres queridos y también si hay iniciativas de, de reparación a las víctimas, que es uno de los deberes del Estado en temas como este. Muchas gracias. I now invite my brother Commissioner Joel Hernández um, to intervene. Gra gracias, Presidenta. Y me van a faltar las palabras para expresarme en esta ocasión. Así que voy a recurrir a, a mi idioma, al español, para primero, como ya lo ha hecho Antonia, expresar mi solidaridad, eh, abrazarlos desde aquí, a ustedes, a, a los que están aquí presentes, a todos aquellos que tienen a un ser querido sin encontrar. Debe ser un dolor inimaginable. Y también reconozco la sensibilidad mostrada por la representación estatal, la representación del Estado, en esta, ante esta dramática situación, que es una de las muchas caras que nos muestra la migración de hoy en día. Y empiezo precisamente por señalar que este tema tenemos que verlo en su justa dimensión, estrictamente en su dimensión humanitaria. No voy a hablar aquí del problema del, del reto enorme que tiene la humanidad en el tema migración, porque creo que nos estaríamos perdiendo del foco. Tampoco voy a hablar 
de todo el proceso que se tiene que hacer desde que una persona desaparece hasta que el familiar lo encuentra y en caso de que esta persona haya fallecido, recuperar los restos. Porque el, 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 el tránsito de todas estas etapas es enorme. Yo me quiero centrar en algo muy específico, que es la existencia de información de DNA que ha venido siendo recogido por un grupo de organizaciones forénsicas, por un grupo de universidades, por laboratorios, por la sociedad civil, y que las quiere poner a disposición de las autoridades de los Estados Unidos para la identificación de los restos. Seguramente hay otros esfuerzos, y seguramente los esfuerzos no van a ser suficientes para resolver eh, el, el enorme problema que existe en esta ruta migratoria que empieza principalmente en Centroamérica, que recorre México y que llega hasta Estados Unidos. Sería un esfuerzo que tal vez tendríamos que abordarlo a otro nivel. Yo lo que quiero es simplemente reconocer el esfuerzo que han hecho estos grupos de organizaciones y que sobre la base de la buena disposición que han mostrado los representantes del gobierno federal, estrechar una mano a las organizaciones para aprovechar, para no tirar a la basura el gran trabajo que han realizado. Nos queda muy claro, lo ha dicho muy bien la representante, la abogada del FBI, de los eh, requisitos legales que hay que cumplir. Ciertamente yo creo que las organizaciones este, eh, eh, conocen estos requisitos y están en la disposición de ir a cumplir eh, eh, todos los requisitos que sean necesarios para la identificación de, este, de, lo, de los restos. Y también creo que existen aquí buenas prácticas eh, que pueden ser compartidas. El representante de CBP nos mencionaba la práctica que han realizado consulados mexicanos y que creo que también puede ser eh, eh, un modelo para que con otros países de la región puedan compartirse. Mi propuesta es muy sencilla y con esto termino, señora presidenta. Yo quiero poner a disposición de las partes aquí presentes los buenos oficios de la Comisión Interamericana para que eh, atendamos a este grupo de peticionarios, que valoremos el trabajo que han hecho y que nos puedan les, a, este, ayudar a ellos y a nosotros a encontrar el camino para la identificación de los restos. Se pone a su disposición la Comisión este, Interamericana. Yo creo que si trabajamos con este grupo de organizaciones podemos tener un, eh, un modelo, un, 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 eh, podemos establecer un estándar que puede ser replicado eh, en otros este, tipos de cooperación en la materia, en, en nuestra región, pero seguramente en el mundo. Estamos a sus órdenes. Gracias, Presidenta. Thank you very much. Um, before I commence my comments and or questions, I just want to acknowledge the presence um, uh, in the audience of Professor Jim Cavallero, James Cavallero, who is an ex-commissioner and president of the Inter-American Commission. Thank you for being here, Professor. Um, like uh, my colleagues, I cannot express... Um, oh, I beg your pardon. Do you wish to intervene? Yes. Yes, okay. Muchas gracias, Presidenta, Comisionados. Primero, también mis saludos a los familiares, toda mi solidaridad. Es, es admirable realmente la lucha, la persistencia. Son ustedes quienes inspiran a nosotros a seguir luchando por los derechos humanos. Muchas gracias por sus testigos. También a los representantes estatales, es muy bueno mirar una delegación donde el Estado ha movilizado sus autoridades correspondientes para responder adecuadamente a la temática, así que felicito a la, a, a la delegación de Estados Unidos. Tengo tres preguntas y un comentario. Quería una primera a la señora representante de, de, de la unidad de desaparición del, del FBI, si entendí bien, algo así. Uh, quería saber exactamente cuántos, cuántos perfiles de DNA ustedes tienen o en su base de datos de familiares uh, vinculados a la desaparición uh, de migrantes 
e quantos perfis de DNA e os testes também têm em sua base de dados eh, de restos mortais não identificados de pessoas falecidas em la fronteira, em la região de fronteira dos Estados Unidos. E também eh, eh, perguntar ao Estado se há uma disposição dos Estados Unidos de eventualmente eh, eh, acionar solicitudes de cooperação jurídica internacional para suas investigações diretamente aos estados de origem destes migrantes, porque esse também pode ser um caminho para facilitar o ingresso de novas bases de DNA para sua própria base de dados. E, e estão disponíveis um conjunto de acordos multilaterais de cooperação jurídica eh, em matéria penal, em matéria civil, que o Estado dos Estados Unidos tem bilateralmente e multilateralmente com distintos estados na região. E também disponibilizar dessa maneira. Meu comentário é em linha do ao comentário do comissionado Roy Hernandes, de também disponibilizar integralmente da Secretaria Executiva da Comissão Interamericana para seguir eh, nestes passos de construção de uma relação eh, construtiva com os familiares, e a ser seguimento a essa importante temática para eles e também para vocês. Muito obrigada. Thank you very much, um, Executive Secretary Paulo Abreu. I I have to say that I find this matter extremely difficult because the pain that family members must are suffering, have suffered, and will continue to suffer until they have answers um, as to what has happened to their loved ones is unimaginable. It's so, so enormous. I sympathize with all of you um, who are here with photographs of your loved ones, with memories of your loved ones and who suffer in the lack of knowledge. That must be the most painful thing um, anybody can live with. <coughs> and I <coughs> don't understand, but cannot fully comprehend. It's too large. So please accept my sympathy um, in that regard. But with what can we do practically to assist? And uh, it has been mentioned by my colleagues, I adopt what they say and so on. It seems to me that there has been a slip between the cup and the lip in this matter, and with very serious and egregious um, consequences. Um, you, you have forensic uh, um, scientists here who can assist, and uh, the commission, as has been said, we can, we can help maybe to get you two together to sit down in a practical, discussion on how you can sort out, because it's a hell of a backlog that we have. And if my, my, the information we got about cremations um, is true, those will have to be explained. At least there must be records somewhere of how many persons, where they were found, and so on and so forth, um, before these cremations occurred, whether they were male, female, child, um, elderly and, and so on, whatever information can be there. Yes, it would take time, but it behoves the state to do whatever it can in its power to solve this. Because as uh, um, the representative mentioned, it is a, your international human rights obligation to identify the remains. And your law enforcement persons in the border areas, when a uh, uh, um, remains of anyone is found, they ought to ensure that samples are taken and, and properly secured um, for future um, DNA testing if that is necessary, if they cannot be identified by face, facial um, phot photography. Um, so I, 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 I have great faith that from what you said um, earlier and how you spoke, that you do intend and have the will to work towards um, um, solving this egregious situation and give some peace to these people 
and the others who are not even here today. And I'm sure your, your life would be much lighter and um, burden would be off your shoulders if, if you do succeed in that. Please, um, let's just try to do something and ask for our help. We do, we may be a commission of human rights um, and uh, mix, well, we come from all over the place with mixed talents and so on, but we are mandated to help in situations like this. And, and we are willing to do whatever we can whenever you require our assistance because it's both the state and the representatives we have to work with, and we will. So I wish us all success in this regard. I would give, um, it would put me in serious trouble, but I would give um, five minutes to each side for your closing remarks. I'm sure the state wouldn't use five minutes. Five minutes. Can I take 30 seconds? Uh, I'd just like to thank the FBI and Border Patrol for being here because for the 19 years I've been working in Tucson, we've established great working relationships. Uh, going back to 2000 with the Tucson sector, meeting with Clyde Bensonhofer and uh, Tom Gardner. And the FBI has been wonderful. Uh, ben Nock, your uh, CODIS administrator, uh, Cindy Johnston at CGIS, and Brian Johnston and the FBI, FBI Light, uh, Latent Fingerprint uh, Department, they've been wonderful partners. And part of the reason we're successful in Tucson is because we utilize those assets. I think this is on. No. Let's try that. No, you don't have to press. Oh, sorry. It's more advanced than I realized. OK. Um, I also would like to join in expressing um, our appreciation for your compassion and the dignity of uh, recognizing the pain and, and anguish that the failure to identify uh, remains found in, on, in border states' cause, causes. Uh, we really do believe, and, and, and it is why we made the petition to the Inter-American Commission to act as a, to convene the parties, mm -hmm. to have a practical discussion and look for ways to implement a solution. I think there's a number of ways for us to find a solution to this issue. Um, they're quite technical, um, but the parties are, uh, and particularly the forensic scientists, are well prepared um, to talk about solutions that will abide by quality assurance standards and other legislative requirements um, from, from federal law. Um, and so we, we would like to, if possible, find a timeline mm -hmm. to expedite that discussion. Mm -hmm. um, the family members have waited a very, very long time. Uh, Doña Irma has waited 20 years. Um, we do believe that a large-scale crossing will produce hundreds of matches. Um, and so if we can expedite that conversation, we can then begin to provide answers to the family members. For the most part, I think it's important for us to recognize that we have a shared mission here. We have the shared mission of finding a way to identify these remains. Um, I think there is, a, is, there is one disagreement of interpretation of law. And if I may, I would like to ask for a clarification because I think it's, it, it could be significant. We do not see any technical or legal reason why uh, the reference samples can't be incorporated um, and compared to uh, the samples taken from, from the remains. Um, uh, Ms. Wolf uh, said there was a statutory requirement of law enforcement presence at the, at the moment of collection. We so, see no statu such statutory requirement. And so if possible, it would be helpful for us if you could clarify exactly what is the federal legislation that requires law enforcement um, presence. Our interpretation is there's a policy requirement, um, which certainly can be changed. And, and the FBI is, is mandated to make those changes. Um, so I just wanted to, if we could get that clarification. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, the representative of the United States, five minutes. Thank you, um, mm -hmm. uh, President. We, we will provide, and I think we have the answer here, but we will provide it uh, in writing regarding uh, the collection and specifically citing whether it's statute or policy. Um, regarding some of the questions that were asked regarding mm -hmm 
specifically remains identified and family members input it into the system. We have numbers here, but we will also provide that in writing to make sure that our, they're completely accurate. And if there's any other pending questions, we'll be happy to, to submit them after the hearing. Yes, um, thank you. I now um, will make a couple of comments and maybe requests to close this meeting. Um, I'll add to what you could reply to. The, it was said in the beginning of the submissions that meetings had been held for six years on how to um, um, test and, and identify the remains. Could you tell us in writing what went on in those meetings and why for six long years no resolution was arrived at? And in relation to the legal provision just mentioned, which your interpretation and their interpretation, part of the mandate of the commission is that we can look at statutes and um, statutory provisions and, and do uh, um, an opinion um, um, to states and to parties. And in fact, if there is new legislation required, we can look at the drafts to, to assist whether they meet with the required standards. So we would like to see this provision so that we can ourselves come to uh, an interpretative con conclusion. Uh, if I could preview yeah. the mm -hmm. answer. Um, it is a combination both of the statutory requirements and policy. And as you said, policy can be changed of in a course. heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to work for. And then the statute will follow. But uh, we need to take the first steps to do that. And they are not insurmountable. They just have to be done. But could you inform us what part is policy and what part is statutory and the content of the statute? I think Thank my you. office would no, prefer no, that no, to no. be done in writing. Yes, yes. in writing would be, would be best. Yeah. Um, I th it w according to the ENDIS operational guidelines, um, which establishes a requirement of law enforcement presence um, to verify consent, I would ask that the representation of the United States think how in this particular situation, how the presence of law enforcement is actually a deterrent. Um, and is, is and can be interpreted by family members whose legal status in the United States uh, may not be secure, or individuals who have different relate different experiences with government. How can it be? How it can be interpreted as coercive? Thank you. And I am sensitive. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, but anyway, we have to um, bring this um, hearing to an end, and we w and wish and will do all in our power to ensure success. No, we can't. No. Oh, 12. <laughs> Thank you very much to everyone who is here. Thanks to members of the public and to the interpreters. This meeting, this hearing is at an end. The next one starts now. No, no. We'll have, you can give we'll have to minutes. start. Yes. Okay, the next one will start in 10 minutes.